I have uh, something that God has laid upon my heart, and I have rearranged the schedule of the service so that I could take the remainder of the time to share with you guys. Uh, I would be a hypocritical pastor for the Lord to lay something on my heart and not be willing to share it. When you're turning your Bibles to 2 Timothy, although I'm going to be honest, that we will turn to and give you a number of passages tonight. And uh, I wasn't sure the best way to do this, um, but I knew that God wanted me to do this. And so I, I am going to just allow God to lead me as we go through and explain what he has laid on my heart. Um, it was um, 14 years ago that Pastor Denoff invited me, almost 14 years ago, to Fellowship Baptist Church. One of the coolest weekends of my life. And uh, I, I knew from then that God was going to lead me to Fellowship Baptist Church. He said, how did you know it? I had a peace that came over me like none other. Amen. I had uh, served as a youth pastor for a number of years. And then six and a half years ago, I stepped in as the intern pastor for Pastor Denoff. He was having surgery and he met with me in his office and he said, uh, he said, I, I need you to preach for me. I did that for a full year and I loved it. Five and a half years ago, I stepped in to become the senior pastor of Fellowship Baptist Church. I'm not sure of the opinions and thoughts that were behind the scenes, but regardless of all those, that I felt that God had led me to this point, and I just had to follow in His will. During that time, I can honestly say that I was on cloud nine. I never would have dreamed that God would bless me so much to be part of such an incredible ministry, and especially in the capacity of being the pastor. I had a, a number of pastors and outside people that came to me there in that time and they told me, I don't envy your job. And I thought, dude, do you see the job that I have? Do you have any idea how blessed I am? They said, that's not what we're talking about. What they were talking about, I didn't get. They were asking me the question and saying, do you realize that you're stepping in for a pastor that's been in the same spot, in the same leadership for 45 years? He said, there's pros and cons to that, but you will soon discover both. A lot of churches that have gone through multiple pastors know what it's like, because they've gone through that change of leadership, they've gone through change. But a church that has never gone through that didn't know what to expect. So I'm going to tell you right now, as your pastor, I don't have all the answers. I don't know all the best, best methods, and I don't have all the best programs. But I know what my job is. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 gives it to me. You say, are, 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 why are you saying this? I, I want you to know that my job description comes from God's word, not from man. Not from Baptist traditions and not from any kind of book that you'd buy from Lifeway. And it sums it up really in three words. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, which is truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, still challenging the preacher. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I tell you this because it is my priority, it is my calling, it is my life, it is my purpose. We live in a changing world with an unchanging gospel, I'm thankful for that. God has not changed, his word has not changed, and his mission has not changed. As a matter of fact, he made us a promise in Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. I'm thankful that the truth that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood for is the same truth that I stand for. And the same God that went with them inside the fiery furnace is the same God that stands with us every single day in the midst of this world of opposition. His truth endures to every generation. It's effective for every generation. The Bible days, the word of God was effective. During the pilgrim days, the word of God was effective. During the Civil War, World War I, World War II. 
during the early America, during the farm days, during the times where churches were just starting, during the time that churches were flourishing, to the time that churches are facing opposition, God's word still stands true. So I take the Bible and I write out what God says. Not my opinion, not my feelings, but I use what God has given me as the authority of his doctrine to guide us. There are certain things that God has given us. I want to start with this, and I know not everybody's going to see it, but I am a visual person, so I, I want you to know how I see this as I go through this. You start here, and what I want to do is I want to start on this side, which is God. You have it because what I read here is a non-negotiable. It doesn't matter if the world changes. It doesn't matter how things change around us. And through that, God has given us the mission. The mission has not changed. The mission has come from God. The mission is what we do every single day. When you guys see what we do of preaching, having invitations, standing out on Broad Street Mission, or whether it's sending missionaries around the world, or helping Ben and Jennifer start a church down the street 45 minutes away from here. You know what we're doing? We're doing what God has told us to do. And it's a non-negotiable. Let me put a third thing here. This is our purpose. This is what God has placed you and I here to do. And I know sometimes we question that. That's why we have the word of God to guide us and keep us on track so that we know what it is. If you were to take the Bible and break it apart and, and just take God's word, you would see that the church was not necessarily all the things that we add to it today, but the church was a gathering of unified people that were gathered in the Spirit of God. They fellowshiped, they shared life, they shared trials, they cared for one another. This morning I saw a lot of that going on, and I thank God for it. They gave up what they had in Acts chapter 2 for the, the sake of others. <laughs> Can you imagine a church that was so in love with one another and the purpose that they were willing to sell their home to find out that somebody else needed a home or, or different crazy things that went on, but it was just the power of God that led them to be unified, pulled together to accomplish what? What God said, the mission and his purpose. And you see all these things that were going on. They gathered together. The Bible shows us times that they sung songs, even at communion. And the Bible says, and they sung a song, and they sung a hymn, and they went out. They had communion. They had preaching. They baptized, and they added people to the church. The Bible even says that they even gathered house to house for fellowship and breaking of bread. And they had this incredible unity in the middle of opposition. So there I, I learn, and I, I can take you, and I can prove to you that there was things like teaching. There was preaching. There was evangelism. There was all these different things, and I could go on and on and on of what God said that there ought to be. There, there was family. You say, how do you, when, you, when you're going to touch on these things, and I could make a huge list of those things, you, you, there, there was worship and all these. And you say, how do you know that? Because God has given me the inspired word of God that spells it out to me. I don't have to question. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to try to go to Lifeway to rent a book or buy a book or whatever to try to pull it in and say, oh, what was it? God has made it so clear. God never meant for us as Christians to try to wander through the world and figure it out. It was never God's intent. What God wanted us to do and how God wanted us to do it when he wanted it done a certain way he told us. So how do you do these things? Just take the preaching part of it. How do you do that? Well, I could take you to the Bible. I could show you a man named Jesus. You know what? God named Jesus. He, he one time preached where he got into a boat and pushed the boat as, uh, away from the shore and he preached from that. It was because there were so many people that wanted to hear the truth that they gathered around him. Jesus evangelized even from the cross. He reached over while he was on the cross and he was reaching out to the guy that was a sinner next to him. Paul wrote and preached from jail oftentimes. The Bible says, and he was bragging, and how I wrote this message is one by one, when I'm saying, God, help me, and, and I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, Lord, give me peace and direction within my life, I, God would take me to the epistles, and I would go through and read different things that Paul wrote to the local church. I saw that, man, Paul had such an incredible passion. 
but he didn't have a pulpit oftentimes. He had a rock or a jail cell. Sometimes we read how they met in the upper room or underground churches or they preached on the streets. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, when thou preachest, preach from a pulpit that should be 4.5 feet tall. There's, there's a lot of things that we've created in Ad, but I know that my job is to preach the truth and to preach the gospel, but sometimes we add to it. So how should things be done? How do you know from time to time how what God said of those things should be done? Well, we, we do things because the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 18, but if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 26 or 25 says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying. See, the, the way that I know what God wants us to do to apply these things to life is I have something inside of me called the Spirit of God. And I believe that God works inside all of us, but I also know that God works through a pastor to lead and guide in a special way because God has called us to be a shepherd. I don't want to say that to lift myself up. I say that because, once again, it's doctrine. It's God's word. Oftentimes, I've heard Pastor and Mrs. Denoff both say, and Mrs. Denoff even alluded to this this morning, and when you say, how did you get here? Do you know what the response will be? God led us here. God told me, this is where you're to start a church. God led me to this property. God led, God led, God led. And I realized it wasn't even in the midst of their opposition. When upside people were saying, I don't believe that you should do it that way, they stood back and said, listen, I have to follow the Spirit of God. And God blessed. And God continues to bless when we do it that way. God fulfills his plan by leading people in the Spirit of God. God has worked this way, and God continues to work this way. I've had people ask me, because we've done different changes, and that's why I am openly standing at a pulpit before my people that I love very much and answering questions that people have said to me, and they have said, I worry about the direction of the church. Or, Where is Pastor Tony headed? What is his motive? What is his goal? What is he doing? My heart has always been to please God in whatever he has told us to do. In Matthew 28, 19, the Bible says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Jesus gave this command that is a non-negotiable. He said, Go and preach and teach. And I almost feel like, and I'm not going to say and elevate myself because there's no way possible that I want to stand up here and say, oh, praise God, Pastor Tony, because of this. But at the same time, I want to make sure that people know my heart. And sometimes I think people question it when I'm not transparent enough for them to understand. So when the Bible says go into all the world, and I took that as my mission and my purpose I began to ask God, how do I apply those things to our church? People have asked me, what, what is my heart, my direction? Since I have taken over as pastor, and I'm just going to list some things because I honestly felt led of God to say this. My goal was to expand on these things as much as possible, and so I replaced our entire bus fleet. I'm not saying I is this, but through what God has led me to do. We bought new church fans, to expand our ministries of reaching out. We bought with cash a senior van to expand our ministries. We started Broad Street Mission to expand evangelism. We created and designed custom tracks to put at every door so that people can walk out of the door of the church and spread the gospel. We've expanded our missions program. We've expanded our Christmas drama outreach to five nights. We've expanded our Vacation Bible School outreach, and God has blessed, and you guys know that. God has expanded part of our ministries to reach out through jail ministries, nursing homes, anti-abortion clinic, crack house ministry, and many others. The Bible says also, teaching them to observe all things. So I want to do the very best that we can with those things. So we installed in our church a bookstore. We expanded our kids' education facility by Kidstown. We started Bible-based recovery groups. 
we expanded our Sunday school ministry and was able to double the adult Sunday school ministry in our church. We added online messages to reach out to those that could not attend to hear the gospel. We started an annual revival. We expanded our outreach to be able to go down the teen revolution to be able to reach out to not only Columbus, but the preaching around our nation through teens. We added assimilation process of Christianity 101 and starting point involving things. And you say, what was all that about? I guess I wonder when people say, what's his heart? I, I was hoping that it kind of spoke for itself. And it's not, I'm not saying, oh, God, don't, don't stand and applaud and everything, because I'm here to tell you that's my purpose and that's my mission is to do those things. But so often, those aren't the things that people are talking about. There's another side of this, and then there is us. And through us, we have things like programs. And programs are things that we've created. And what they are, honestly, they're methods. If we were to be honest, these are methods. If I was to list these methods... Methods you're not going to find necessarily in the Bible. I know that we're to carry people to Christ, but I also know that we created something called a bus ministry. I know we're to praise God, so we created a choir. I know we're to preach, so we created service times. And I, I, I could go on and on and on and on and say all the things that we do of a wana, of a worship team, of all these different things. But what are all these things that we do? Worship team and Awana and all these that we're doing there. They are things that we created to help us accomplish these things. Does that, does that make sense? They, they, years ago during the great revivals, they didn't have bus ministries and they, did, they didn't have Awana. They didn't have vacation Bible school, but through time... God opened doors and changed things to where we still needed the mission, so we created programs to help us accomplish the purpose. That's what God's called us to do. And through all of these things, our goal is to lift up Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, there's a lot of things that I could put on both sides of that list. But people have said to me that we're getting away. People have told me and said in rumors and the groups that gather in the hallways. A lot of you know who they are. It's become a separate church that meets. It's Fellowship Baptist Church Hall Ministry. And uh, they meet out there to talk about, and the common question from what I understand is we are getting away from certain things. My question that I'm asking you is, what side of this board are we getting away from? Is it the things that we created or the things that God has told us? And, and when I found out that we could change just one little aspect of one of these things, and people go, whoa, what, what, what are you doing? See, the thing is, as long as we created it and it's a non-negotiable, we can change it. And the way that we were able to reach more people and do more things is because God has given us through the Spirit of God the leadership to apply these things to these things so that we might reach people with the gospel. Jesus did a lot of crazy things that people did not understand. They hated Jesus because of it, because they did not follow their tradition. They say, where did we get these things? They came from God. They were inspired and brought down to us. And a lot of these things are traditions. Somewhere along the line, so many started a bus ministry, and so many started a choir, and so many started a worship team, and so many started a wana, and so many... That, and so if it works, you know what we do? We pass it on and say, hey, dude, this really does well. Hey, we've been able to reach a lot of people this way. Hey, this is, this is awesome, and I thank God for it. And to be honest, a lot of these things are awesome. They continue, and I'm not getting up here. I'm not about to go, and yeah, we're scratching. No, not at all. Why? Because if it's working to accomplish the purpose, then we continue it. But there's a fear in that. Even though Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was following the will of his Father. In Mark chapter 7, verse 8, they say, For the laying aside the commandments of God, he's talking to the Pharisees. Ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups were trivial things. Okay? They, they, were, they were not this. They were this. And he said, as the washing of pots and cups... 
and many other things like the, that you do. In verse 9 he says, and he said unto them, full well you reject the commandments of God that ye may keep your own traditions. Do you, do you know what I have found? What I get the most people upset about saying that I compromise or getting away or where whatever it is has nothing to do with this side. It all comes from our side. Because we take things that we created and we lift it up and say, do not touch. You know what Jesus said to them? I will never allow you to hold up higher what you've created over what I've commanded. And the Pharisees thought they were doing good things because they took the foundation of something that was good and they kept adding to it. Guys, if we were to be honest, a lot of the things that we do as a church, meeting at 10, worship at 11, Sunday at 6, choir practice at 4.30, worship team on the stage, I, I could go on and on and on and on. Do you know where all of that stuff falls is all over here. You're not going to read in the Bible where God said, you must, you know, meet at 10 o'clock. You must say, if, if God led us to have service at 3.42 p.m. on Sunday afternoon, we're still doing the right thing. But you better put up your dukes if you change 10 or 11. And not that I'm doing that, okay? Don't, don't sit there and brace for something. There's nothing coming at the end. Oh, you're like, where are you going, big boy? You know, just... There's no, there's no thing that I'm going to surprise you with at the end of this. I promise you. But I tell you, what I have learned is with the purpose of what we have that we're running out of time. And yet, as we're running out of time, I see more division and backbiting and public display, display of disgust from the stage and off the stage. And sometimes we see more passion to hold on to these things than we do for the purpose of why God's called us. Think, man, some people, you mess, and we could go down the list, you mess with that, dude, you'll fight for it. I, w I wish we felt that way about this. I, I, I wish we were that passionate about what God's called us to do. I wish, because I, I can take you and bring conviction to people's hearts and young people's hearts and the teenagers' hearts and the emerged class hearts and go on the road when I, when I take it from here because this is what God said. And, and I can hold people and say it's not going to change because God said it. But when we try to hold people to this side of it because we said it and say that these things aren't going to change... We have just stepped up and played God. I, I take you to a man. Paul was teaching. Jesus gave us the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But then Jesus raised up a man to, to affect the church, to write to the church, the epistles to the church. And he was one of the most influential preachers and men that had ever lived and I'm not saying that to elevate a man, but I'm just saying we, can, we know that by how God used him to literally spread the gospel across nations. And even to the point where here we are in 2014, we're still saying, hey, turn in your Bible, let me show you. So let me turn in your Bible and let, you show you, let me show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. Why did he have such an impact? How in the world did this man that his job was going church to church to church and leading and changing and cultures and, and, and traveling across sea and getting out in a boat and going into a basement to going into the upper room to doing all these things. How did this man able to accomplish so much? And he says over and over again, he was led of the spirit of God and he followed God to do this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. What was his priority? Spelled it out. He said, this is what I'm married to. I'm, not, I'm married to the purpose. I'm not married to the program. I, 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 will, I will adapt the program to accomplish the purpose. Verse 19. For though I am free from all men... Yet have I made myself a servant unto all that I might gain the more. 
You say, wow, he was, a, he, he was only reaching people because he was compromising to reach so many people. For though I be free from all men, I've made myself a servant of all that I might gain the more. And of the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law as without the law being not without the law of God but under the law of Christ that I might gain them that are without the law. And to the weak I became as the weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And he said this I do because this is what I done when I grew up. He said, this I do because this is what was passed on to me to do and I'm not going to veer from it. Actually, he said, and this I do for the gospel's sake, which is the priority of our life, that I might be partakers thereof of you. This does not mean that we become drunk to save those that are drunkards. This does not mean that we steal to be able to identify with the thieves. We do not compromise and veer from the truth. And just so you know that people misunderstand this and say they're compromising. Compromising is when we get away from what is right, not when we get away from what we've been told. It's it's not about traditions that is compromising. Compromising is when we veer from what God has said. Now I get into the application. I'm going to be honest. I did some research. I, I want you to know for 30 Seven years, I have grown up in an independent, fundamental Baptist church. The same doctrine, the same teaching, the same mission as Fellowship Baptist Church. And I, I, I have done for the last two weeks, off and on, studied and wanted to know where we are and what's going on. And I have heard more than once it's saying that the independent Baptist is one of the fastest dying denominations there is. One survey said... It didn't even register of independent Baptists. One of them showed a chart of the top 25 growing churches in the nation was independent Baptist churches. And then they showed the most recent one, and we don't even make the list. Some churches, so that I'm talking about right now, were so great that they were the ones sending out churches and mass producing churches. And those same churches that I'm referencing right now have already closed, sold their buildings to other ministries. My home church that I was in, Anchor Baptist Church in Priceville, Alabama, went from running over 300 when I was a teenager and a young person there to the fact that the church eventually died out, got down to just a handful of people, and they sold the building to another church. So weird for me to drive through my hometown and look over at the church that I was at when I was a kid and see another sign out there of what used to be. The slogan of the independent Baptist was always, we will stick to the old ways. We will stick to the old past. Let me ask you, when the Bible talks about not veering from the old past and the old ways, what side was it talking about? When he said, don't get away, don't veer, don't compromise. But you know what? I grew up in a world that when they got up to preach, they would preach about their methods they would preach about three to thrive and da 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 and all these other things that they would say that was the necessities. Although you could not find those things in Scripture, and I know there's principles of forsake not the assembling, and, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, and trust me, those are biblical principles. The reason that we're here tonight at Fellowship Baptist Church on a Sunday night when a lot of churches are not meeting on Sunday night, because this works for us. So I could put over there and put Sunday night worship service, and I'm going to say, hey, thank God, bless it. Because God is blessing it. And God is using it to do what? Oh, teaching, preaching, evangelizing, and edifying the family. God showed me a lot of things through this. God has showed me that when I was a kid, we went to neighborhood Bible clubs. And we would preach the gospel and teach the gospel in a garage on crates with two by four stretched across them. We'd bring in kids from the community using little Debbie Cates. My mom was awesome with it. Used puppet shows and all that stuff. When I was in Brazil, we did it differently. We met in basements of people's houses even, sat on lawn chairs. When I was in Thailand, it was totally different. We actually laid out tarps inside villages and preached the gospel. But I realized something, that God worked in all of those. 
not because of the method that we use, but because of the principle of following the preaching, teaching, and the mission of God. That, that it, it works. And God said, when go into all the nation and preach and teach and do all those things, God said that I will be to every generation because this would never change or lose its power when it's done according to God. Methods change. When we reject the next when we reject change, we reject the next generation that God is calling us to reach. People have said to me, I wish we could just go back to the good old days. I, could, I wish we could go back to the church when it was done down home. I'm old school, or I like it this, or I like it that. Let me ask you, how far back do you want to go? How, how far back do you want to go? I could take you back to the time of war where they didn't have Wednesday night service. And if I was to tell you, we're going to do away with Wednesday night. No, 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 don't go that far back. And said, well, they didn't start that till the 30s and 40s. Well, then fast forward us a little bit. And then I tell you about, no, 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 go back, 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 D.L. Moody, D.L. Moody. And then it's just, where, where do you want to go? And, and the thing is, God didn't call me and tell me to revive what once was. He said to me in Proverbs 29, verse 18, and again, I take you to the Bible, where there is no vision, the people perish. Let me explain in vision. Let's go. That, that's vision. He said, oh, so you throw everything behind. No, the Bible even shows how they even took the stones and they brought it out as a remor- memorial, a reminder of what God has done. But sometimes we sit there and cry and mourn and worship and hold up the stones Rather than pursuing the mission that God's given us. Paul, Paul, Paul doesn't teach and instruct us to forget where we came from. But we ought to have a passion for where we're going. He, he said in Hebrews 12.1. And let us run with patience the race that has been set before us. Not that we forget the past or our heritage. We appreciate those things. And I'm telling you that I have made changes that have made people upset, and I know about it. And I've realized that there's no way to make anybody happy, but I think I got to a point where it was just so much that it honestly got to the point where I was losing my joy of ministry. I was getting to the point where I, I, I had to dodge so many little cell groups through the hallway that I felt like I was so discouraged by the way that I got up to preach. And just being honest, that I was thinking, well, I know what they've been saying, I know how they feel and all this, That I would feel literally my flesh pulling me back because I was paranoid of what I was going to say and what I was going to do. Every time that I had an idea or a plan or whatever, in the last couple times that we've met, I've told the guys, I say, you know what, I just don't want to do it. And I realized that that was not of God, it was my flesh. And I allowed the devil to get into my life, and for that I am sorry. I realize that I am not Superman, but I have realized that God has given me the Spirit of God to lead. I have had things said about me that are not true. Somebody stood on this stage. From now on, when you talk about me, you need to look around and make sure I'm not there. And said that Tony is, the next thing that's going to go is he's going to be fading out this choir. Let me tell you, the reason that the lights are in the ceiling... And those choir mics were there because I personally went on a lift and I put them there myself. And I'm not saying that to brag on myself, but why in the world would I do that if I was doing away with that? And, and I, I turn around and I say, what evidence do you have? And if you have none, shut your mouth. Because it is gossip. We have... Some ministries now that we have allowed people to voice their opinions so much that now other people don't want to be part of those ministries because they talk about how the talking and chatter and backbiting and backstabbing has gotten so bad that people are miserable being part of that. I, 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 I'm saying this because I, I am sharing my heart with you because I love my church too much not to say what I'm saying. I, I, I did something, and I'm using this as an illustration, because I've realized that a lot of people don't understand my heart and what I do. 
Let me ask you, how many of our ladies that are part of our nursery understood the problem for the last two, three, four years that we've had within frustration of space, location, and everything else? Raise your hand, you ladies that are part of that ministry, okay. People don't have any idea of what we've gone through with that. You, you won't understand. You say, well, I have nothing to do with that ministry. I know. But can, can you put a little confidence in me that I do? See, the ladies experienced all these problems in the past of, of, of space and safety and the location and the laws have changed. And the way that people, do you realize that if their children are not safe, they will not walk into a sanctuary? That's the most precious thing they have, and they don't know you from Adam when they walk through the door of a church. Then, then so I said, we, we need to do something to fix this. And, and so I, I, I want to remind you, why are we here? And you're going to say, well, we're here to reach and evangelize and reach families and teach and all these things that God has commanded us to do. And so you know what my heart in making that decision was? We have to do something big to change this. See, moms would come through the door with a child or an infant and a baby carrier and a Bible and a diaper bag, and they'd have to haul it upstairs to go searching for a hidden nursery. Oh, it was simple. We just told them when they walked through the door, you go up those steps and turn left. Go up that flight of steps, turn left. Go to the water fountain, turn left, and you'll find the nursery in the corner. And she's got this toddler baby and everything, and there she's going up. I've seen it a hundred times, and some of you have passed them going up and doing that. And here, as we're telling them, and we're so glad you're here, and we're here for you, and we're here, this is not about us. It's all for the glory of God. You know, it's not about us. We're standing next to a locked door that says offices, open Monday to Friday. And I thought, wait a minute. I'll walk up the steps. You go in here. Because it's not about us. You know what was said of that because I did that? It was said that I don't care about older people in the church. And I started realizing how often do those moms have to approach that nursery? It's three to four times a week. But there's so, most of the people that want to stop into the, nur- or to, to the offices, sometimes it's nurseries, stop into the offices, they do that maybe once every two, three, four, six months. And I thought, what is our priority of what we're trying to accomplish? And you can step back and say, well, I wanted to put them up there. Man, if I was, had my choice, I wish we would have built everything on one floor. But it's not the cards that were dealt. So you know what I do? I'm going to make the best with what I have to accomplish this. That's what I'm going to do. And you know who has to walk up those steps more than any of you? <laughs> My office is up there. And, and, and I say, oh man, it was, but what are we here for? For you to say that I did that because I don't like old people is the same thing for me to say that you don't like babies. Or you don't like moms. Or you don't like reaching people. And you say, oh, that's an unfair statement. Well, then what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Help me. Say, well, I just didn't understand that. Come ask me. Don't talk about it in the halls. Besides that, what are we telling the people coming into our church? When they, when they have to go through a crowd of people to get to hear the gospel, when they have to walk through God's people to get there after church has started. God is blessed, and I am so thankful and I, I, I have just realized that no matter what I do, that I, I, I cannot seem to figure out that perfect balance. And I am trying. Because for, for so off long, I saw that we were, you know, it's like people would say, like, we're, we're going after. Did you guys realize five years ago that our college and career ministry got down to zero people? Not that we didn't have them in the church, we just, we didn't have anything going on. And I realized that I didn't have a lot of people coming up to me really upset about that. But you know what I did have a lot of people upset about? Once we did gather 40, 50 of them together, and we've been running that through Nathan and Ashley and Pastor Joe and Miss Beck and them doing that. Then they got together and they started having this worship night once a quarter 
They invite college students. They have preaching and they have worship. It is not Bill and Gloria Gaither style. It is worship style. See, that's not my style. It wasn't created for you. It was created for the college students. And you're not going to understand that, and that's okay. But the thing is, I am thanking God for the 42 that are showing up. Rather than getting drunk, they're showing up to a worship night to hear preaching. Say, well, I don't like it. I don't like it. Then let me ask you, what were you doing to reach college students? Well, I wasn't doing anything. Well, I think I like our way better than your way. And some having compassion, making a difference. The next verse goes on to say, in pulling them out of the fire. Some save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. We have a world, a changing world, a messed up world, spiraling into hell. And we stand there and plead and cry and point and beg and everything this side. When God is begging to us to refocus on this side. Can I tell you, e- e- even with this, I, I, I look at our services and, and I, I'm trying to implement new songs. And, and then people say, I don't like that song. And so I run over here and I, and, and I realize that I, I'm going crazy. Because I want to reach into a younger generation. And even the music, to be honest, I like. When, when, I'll, I'll tell you what. I, I, I love the song that we sung this morning. Never once did I ever walk alone. You are faithful. You are faithful. I, I tell you, that speaks to my heart. And I'm not saying that some of these other songs, and you say, well, some of the songs you pick, I just don't like. Some of the songs that I pick, I don't like. Amen. And then I turn around and said, I don't like that. But then we, we get all upset, and, and all of a sudden the devil just slithers in and starts you know, all this, and I'm thinking, hey, Let's not forget why we're here. But, but I've got to learn that I've got to do something to reach this generation. And sometimes it get, means getting put out of all of our comfort zones. Some of you say, well, I wish we just did hymns. Well, then you would push out this generation. Some say, I wish we did all worship uh, songs. Then we push out this generation. I, I, I wish we just did I'll Fly Away. And then the next person says, I, I, I wish that we just did How Great Is Our God by Chris Hunter. And you say, which one do you please? I don't please either of them. I've got to please God. That's it. I have got to please God. But as a shepherd, and as your shepherd, I have to keep both in mind. Do you understand that I have to keep both? And in trying to find that and trying to reach out to both, it's sometimes really hard. Amen. But I can tell you, I'm so thankful of what God is doing. And I'm thankful that we have a, a Christianity 101 class that we had to put out extra chairs because God is blessed. And I'm thankful that on Easter we had 19 saved. And I'm thankful that last week we had 750 some people. And I'm thankful for those things Amen. because it means that God is blessing. And God is working. And is it perfect? No, because I'm imperfect and I'm leading people that are imperfect. Amen, that's right. And I can't change that. But I can ask God to help me and lead me. And every day I just say, Lord, help me to do my very best. Lord, help me not to get in the way. Lord, help me not to make it about me. Yes. Pastor Denall told me, so, Tony, I don't envy you a bit. After I became pastor, I said, wow, thanks for the job, you know. <laughs> he said, there is such, so much crazy, chaotic change going on around us. And he said, I, I just, he said, I don't envy the battles that you have before you. I can tell you that I don't have the answers, but I can tell you that we must keep the main thing the main thing. And as I, as a pastor, step forward and I make a mistake, do me a favor. Number one, love me the way that God loves us. And understand that I don't have it figured out, nor do I claim to. And understand when you're over here and you're complaining, I'm over here beating myself up uh, up about it all already. You understand that some things that I pull back and I say, dear God, why did I do that? And God says, dear God, dear son, why did you do that? I don't know. But in my head, I was just trying to do that because I'm just trying to follow God in doing these things. But you don't help me by talking about me behind my back. 
Because contrary to popular belief, I am approachable and I will talk to you. I'm usually, for the people that know me, I'm one of the last people to leave every Sunday. I normally don't leave this church till after 8 at least or 8.30. I'm not saying that to brag on myself. I'm just saying that that's what it is. I'm a day off and I meet people. I had a family that called me Monday and older people. And they said, well, what if they can't make it up the steps? I go to every person that asks me. So, you know, you're building a said, No, I'm just saying because I know it's on the second floor. And I know not everybody can do it. But all you have to do is say, hey, can I talk to you? Yes. But I'd rather you do that than for the division to go on behind the scenes. The Bible says in the last days, perilous times would come. But let me tell you, the perilous times that are coming should not come within the walls of the church. One last passage and we're going to close. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For I yet pleased men. I should not be the servant of Christ.